Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Lee. Much thanks to the International Land Conservation Network, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, and the European Land Conservation Network for enabling us to come together virtually, uh, albeit not in Barcelona, but uh, great to have folks with us nonetheless. So today we are quite fortunate to be joined by a great group of panelists for a global survey of conservation finance. We have Peter Stein, the Managing Director of Lime Timber, who will talk about the evolution of conservation finance in the United States. We have David Myers, the Executive Director of the Conservation Finance Alliance, who will discuss innovative finance for land-based issues, effective funding and financing, and the breadth of different approaches. We have Marnie Lassen, the Conservation Markets Manager for Trust for Nature Australia who will discuss her experience and Trust for Nature's experience leading the conservation, um, leading conservation conversation about uh, conservation finance in Australia. And Candace Stevens, Head of Innovative Finance and Policy from Wilderness Foundation Africa, who's going to discuss the biodiversity tax incentives in South Africa, focusing on what value they may bring to the conservation community there and in other parts of Africa. So the format for today, each panelist will have 15 minutes with Peter and me sharing our block. Uh, I will attempt to keep us on track. My video is going to pop back up when each speaker has two minutes remaining. So I hope they will forgive me for any interruptions as we get going here. Uh, and the goal is really to leave time for both panel discussion and Q&A. So please wish us luck. Um, a request to submit questions as we go in the uh, Q&A feature, not the chat, as Chandani instructed us. Uh, we're gonna do our best to get to them at the end, but please do uh, lob them our way as we go here. And so Peter and I stopped, thought we'd start with just a bit of table setting on the evolution of conservation funding and financing in the United States, which is the perspective that we come from. Apologies for not including that in my cover slide. So Chandani, if you wanna hit next. Great, thank you. So we'll just add in the United States. Uh, next. We also definitely wanna emphasize from the outset that these efforts are growing around the world. There's so much we have to learn from each other's work, whether from innovation occurring in South Africa and Australia or so many other national contexts. So just because we are primarily based in the United States, that's the bias as we get started here. Uh, but uh, by no means should that be the framing for today's global survey. So um, I wanted to <clears throat> just share a quick word on the conservation finance network. Uh, we aim to equip practitioners with the capabilities to put innovative or just plain effective funding and financing strategies into use for land and resource conservation, restoration, and stewardship objectives. Next. And we should probably just start with a quick definition um, to find what we mean when we use the term conservation finance. And that is really just a range of strategies that generate, manage, or deploy financial resources and align incentives to achieve conservation outcomes sourced from public, philanthropic, private, and or blended sources of capital. This definition is drawn from the Conservation Finance Alliance's most recent report. Please check it out if you haven't already. Uh, and you'll hear more from David Myers in just a bit. Next. So before I hand it over to Peter, I'll just share an appetizer for some of the resources we offer, including our training course, the Conservation Finance Boot Camp, a website and monthly e-news digest that is produced in partnership with the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, webinars, toolkits on select uh, funding and financing sources, and more. Next. And now over to Peter for an introduction to our panelists and a lightning round orientation to the evolution of public, philanthropic, private, and blended sources of capital in the US. So, thank you, Lee. And I'm hoping I am now uh, being seen by those of you who have joined us. Uh, and I wanna just briefly uh, recognize that we are joined uh, with a smorgasbord of expert practitioners from around the globe. Um, we've already mentioned David and Candace and Marnie, and they will be following in that order uh, after my presentation. So let's go to the next slide. And just to give you a sense of, of networks, uh, for those of you who know, I've been involved in the uh, 
the creation of the International Land Conservation Network over the last five or six years. And I've also been involved for many years in the growth and development and practicing of conservation finance in the US. And that has evolved into the Conservation Finance Network since both of these organizations have names that end in network. I thought I'd use this slide to show you how networks actually function a little bit. Uh, Vicki Marles, uh, Victoria Marles, who's the president and CEO of Trust for Nature Victoria in uh, Australia, has been a longtime attendee of the US Land Trust Alliance national conferences. And we got to know each other there. And she actually participated in some of the workshops on conservation finance over the years. She uh, then twisted uh, Marnie Lassen's arm to attend the Conservation Finance Boot Camp that is offered uh, each year by the Conservation Finance Network that took place in at Duke University um, the year she attended four years ago. That caused the Australian Land Conservation Alliance to become more interested in training up, building out, exploring what elements of conservation finance would really have traction in Australia. And uh, through a wonderful uh, experience that uh, a number of us from America have had over the last couple of years, we've been invited to participate in the conservation finance intensives that ALCA and Trust for Nature have, uh, have delivered uh, to the community of practice uh, for conservation finance and land conservation in Australia. And some of the uh, original documents and case studies uh, were provided by the Conservation Finance Network. So that's just uh, a way that these two networks have integrated their work quite a bit. Um, and uh, we see this happening in other parts of the world as well. And, and eventually we see it happening in South Africa. So next slide. Uh, I began my work uh, on the nonprofit side of land conservation in the mid 1970s, when land conservation groups were mostly using their charitable status as financial leverage in securing donations and bargain sales of land and conservation easements in the US. Um, there were very, very few transactions that kind of blended private capital uh, and and uh, uh, public or philanthropic capital, but but it was starting to happen. And one of the very few first uses of, of private debt um, was actually in the state I live in at the very beginning of the establishment of the Vermont Land Trust, they actually had no money, uh, but they had some important properties they needed to acquire. And there was a somewhat friendly local bank who liked them, but didn't like their credit status. Uh, so they were able to secure uh, and this is an example of charitable creditors, they were able to secure pledges from their board members, uh, essentially uh, guarantees uh, to the bank from the board members that allowed the, this very, very brand new, this is 40 years ago, land trust to borrow money from a bank to acquire a critical property in South Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, through the 80s and 90s, we're starting to see some more creative things happen. Uh, foundations uh, in the US, uh, you know, philanthropic foundations are starting to use a mechanism that was developed in the very late 1960s called program related investments. Well, the very first ones were being used by conservation NGOs in the 1980s. And we're starting to see, uh, albeit with different terms or titles or names, uh, the beginnings of investors who wanted to understand and see and demonstrate an impact with their investment beyond the financial return. Um, in those days, perhaps called double and triple bottom line investments. In the uh, later part of that century, in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, we began to see private capital being organized to participate in land conservation deals. Uh, Lime Timber was one of the very first of those. We're also seeing private real estate development happen in partnership with land conservation, a term known as creative land development or sometimes called conservation development. 
And we're um, starting to see some foundations actually use their endowment uh, to invest in some of these businesses. So the very first institutional investor in lime timber was the Jesse Smith Noise Foundation in New York City. And uh, we believe that was the first impact investment uh, made by a private foundation. Um, and that was in the very early 1990s. As we move into the 2000, 2010s, we're beginning to see the growth of uh, organizations that are functioning as intermediaries, uh, particularly in the management of revolving loan funds and regranting mechanisms. These are groups like the Resources Legacy Fund in California or the Open Space Institute in New York or the Land Conservation Loan Program of the uh, Conservation Fund. Uh, we're also starting to see the scaling up of timberland investment management organizations with a conservation strategy. So uh, for years, Lime was operating sort of in the fringes or the wilderness of timberland investment. Uh, and now uh, literally half of the timberland investment management organizations domiciled in the US have experience with conservation easements and carbon transactions. Uh, the other thing that happened uh, during this decade was the development of sort of large-scale ecosystem service investment funds. In the U.S., this was really driven by regulatory schemes under the uh, Federal Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, but all of a sudden significant amounts of private capital were being deployed in the creation of uh, wetland mitigation banks and endangered species habitat banks. Um, and we're also starting to see some public policies that made certain kinds of conservation transactions uh, more feasible. And one great example of that are the four states in the US that have state income tax credit programs that are fungible or resellable. So if you're a landowner in Colorado and you donate a conservation easement, uh, but you don't have the ability to make good use of that state income tax credit, you can actually sell the tax credit to another taxpayer in Colorado. And that's been a, a, a dramatic, that's, that's yielded a dramatic increase in the amount of land conserved in that state. As we go into the future, we're starting to see crowdsourcing uh, really democratizing uh, the pulling together of, of capital for these transactions. Uh, we're starting to see the use of technology that makes some of the financing much more efficient. Uh, in Iowa, we're seeing some very large uh, global agricultural commodity uh, uh, companies get directly involved in uh, the uh, management or support the, the best management practices and uh, increased soil carbon sequestration of, of cropland in Iowa. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to touch very quickly on public funding, philanthropic funding, and private funding, and start with public funding. In the U.S., uh, actually we're making very good progress this week on the permanent uh, support, uh, meaning permanent level of appropriation which is the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Every five years in the U.S., we have a farm bill with a massive conservation title that supports uh, farmland easements uh, in a very big way. And, um, but in, in terms of public money in the U.S., um, about 20 years ago, the shift occurred where the lion's share or the majority of public money comes from state and local sources and a minority comes from federal sources and the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund in Wisconsin is a great example of uh, something that's been around for 25, 28 years now, which is supporting uh, direct acquisitions by state agencies and land trusts in conservation acquisitions and conservation easement acquisitions by state agencies and land trusts in Wisconsin, uh, notwithstanding uh, you know, some challenging politics in that state. In the, it just got renewed last year. Um, we are also lucky to have three congressionally chartered grant-making institutions. These are 
uh, hybrid nonprofits or quest or if we were in England, uh, we would be uh, calling them quangos. Um, but uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the National Park Foundation, and uh, the National Forest Foundation play kind of a unique hybrid role, almost like a public agency, but with more flexibility. Uh, where does the money come from? Uh, comes from referendum and ballot initiatives, uh, comes from legislative actions at state level and local level, uh, comes from collecting damage payments, uh, such as the billions of dollars that uh, were paid as environmental damages from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, and uh, then a wide variety of tax proceeds and the, occur at both the state, federal, and local levels. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, just to touch on this quickly, um, there are some elements of the CARES Act, which is the response by the U.S. government to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that uh, increases the ability to make charitable contributions. Uh, we have some regulatory drivers in places like the five states that front on the Chesapeake Bay, or include the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, uh, which are total, total maximum daily load regulations. Uh, New York it has a $3 billion bond as a climate bond that includes a lot of money for uh, nat nature-based climate solutions, which in turn means money for land conservation. Uh, and then uh, we're we're, it's still a little bit up in the air, but uh, there will be a new sales tax for marijuana legalization in Montana that will be a sub source of support for uh, land conservation in that state. Next slide. Um, in the public NGO financing world, we're, we've already talked about some of the loan funds that are out there. Um, some. Private parties and nonprofits have figured out how to utilize the Federal New Markets Tax Credit Program, which is a, a way of, of yielding a very low cost source of financing if the land conservation project uh, is in a economically distressed census tract. Uh, some of the states, um, led by Ohio, but now with about nine other states, are using their clean water and safe drinking water revolving funds in very innovative ways. There's a new community forest in, uh, in Vermont uh, done by the Trust for Public Land where the financing was provided by that source uh, and then part of the financing was forgiven uh, based on the water, water quality benefits of that land, land conservation project. Let's go to the next slide. Peter, I'm here to give you two minute warning. Good. So uh, we all know about uh, the role of philanthropy, um, always be polite uh, to <laughs> foundations and donors, uh, and they are a you know, remarkable source of gifts and grants. Uh, philanthropy has driven land and easement donations in a very big way in the U.S., going back more than 100 years. Uh, and now we're starting to see uh, more uh, use of, of this term program-related investments. So now there are dozens of foundations making program-related investments for land conservation and water conservation transactions. And we're also seeing quite a big uh, movement to having the foundation portfolios, their endowments aligned with the uh, programmatic interests of foundations known as mission-related investments. And this is even happening through community foundations and the for-profit managers of donor-advised funds. Uh, and I can't help uh, in these times to uh, suggest that the chances that you have to make an authentic connection between public health and nature is something that philanthropy is quite focused on right now. Next slide. Uh, talked about charitable creditors already. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example of a Timberland Investment Management Organization in the, the next slide. Uh, so let's keep going. We're, uh, fortunately, there's gonna be a recording of this presentation so you can read these slides yourself. Uh, but uh, probably 
on this one, well, let's go back one quickly. <laughs> uh, one of the more interesting ones is, is the growth of supply chain uh, activities. Uh, Amazon, for example, was the buyer of uh, the first aggregated carbon offset project in the United States um, as a commitment to their uh, reducing their carbon footprint. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, some of these private investment schemes are actually orchestrated directly by nonprofits. So NatureVest is the impact investment arm of the Nature Conservancy. Eco Trust Forest Management is the for-profit uh, Timberland investment subsidiary of Eco Trust, the nonprofit. Uh, and we just, uh, just in the last couple of months, uh, a very interesting. Uh, organization that started as a for-profit converted to a non-profit, Blue Forest Conservation, who are the proponents and developers of forest resilient bonds, uh, which are being used in California as we speak. Let's go to the next slide. You're about to hear about a blended capital project, but uh, Marnie will touch, I think, will at least mention uh, the uh, interesting water fund in Australia that is a uh, where capital is coming from a variety of sources. Next slide. And just very quickly, this is uh, the uh, the brownish, tannish colored area on this map is 73,000 acres of former industrial paper company land that was acquired by Lime Timber uh, eight years ago now, nine years ago now. Uh, this was uh, viewed as a conservation priority for the last 40 or 50 years by uh, the Nature Conservancy, the state of Wisconsin, US Forest Service. These 73,000 acres form the connection to almost a million acres of existing conservation land in the northeast corner, excuse me, northwest corner of Wisconsin. And it also drains, part of it drains into the Mississippi. Uh, so it's the headwaters of the St. Croix River uh, and the headwaters of the Brule River, which uh, generate into the, uh, flows into the Great Lakes. Uh, this would have only happened uh, because of a partnership that was developed between the Conservation Fund, the Nature Conservancy's Wisconsin chapter, uh, and Lime Timber. So let's go to the next slide. Actually, let's go to the next slide. So uh, Lime Timber is a private timber investment group. Uh, we brought $21 million of equity, of investment capital, that came from some, these are you can see where, where our uh, clients uh, come from. Uh, the Conservation Fund provided $16 million of debt. Uh, about $10 million came from an existing revolving loan fund internal to the Conservation Fund, and $6 million came from a uh, McKnight Foundation program-related investment. We used that money to buy the land from Wausau Paper. We then did a series of conservation easement transactions that conserved uh, about 92% of the land. Then we sold uh, a number of properties, small properties, fee simple, that became additions to county parks and state parks that were part of that ownership. And we sold some orphan properties to private uh, buyers as well. Uh, and then we sold uh, the entire property subject to a perpetual working forest conservation easement to Hancock Timber Resource group um, about two years ago. And um, that's the full cycle of how the money comes in, the transaction, the conservation transactions take place. And then uh, to return the investment to our investors, we sold the property, uh, but it is perpetually encumbered by a conservation easement. So the same sustainable management activities during Lyme's tenure is, are being uh, continued to, during uh, Hancock Timber Resource Group's tenure. And Peter, and I'm just going to check in on. Okay, great. <laughs> so we're we're right on time. So uh, I think will you? Can I introduce David? Yes. So next slide. Actually, you can skip a couple. Yeah. Great. Perfect. So uh, we now have David Myers, Executive Director of the Conservation Finance Alliance. Uh, their work. Uh, takes place uh, almost exclusively outside of the United States. So thank goodness we'll now get a more global perspective. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, 
and thank you um, everyone for um, for inviting us to, to join this uh, really interesting webinar. It's great to be part of this. Um, I'm going to um, give a, a overview of uh, of some uh, finance approaches uh, for, for land conservation, a little marine as well, um, from a global perspective. And if the next, if you could just move to the next slide, just a quick uh, overview of what I'm gonna say today. I'm gonna cover sort of what, what are the breadth, what's the breadth of finance mechanisms? I'll present a, a definition. Thank you, Lee, for, um, for presenting that. Talk a little bit about um, the diversity of, uh, of different finance tools go into a little bit about what are the barriers to scaling uh, finance for nature, and then um, show some examples of some different uh, approaches uh, from, from this broad spectrum of, uh, of solutions. So in the next slide, just a quick um, overview of the Conservation Finance Alliance. It's uh, one of the leading global professional alliances for conservation finance experts, practitioners, and organizations. Our mission promote awareness, expertise, and innovation um, in conservation finance globally. We have four main working groups um, that, that meet on a quarterly basis, uh, each one taking on different projects. The innovation working group has launched a conservation finance incubator. We're supporting 15 different uh, projects and companies um, as they uh, refine and develop and, and launch their, uh, their conservation finance activities. Um, work a lot with environmental trust funds, um, conservation trust funds, and develop practice standards for those. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, a white paper that we've just released, which is in the next slide, um, that uh, just gives you, uh, in the next slide, there's a, a shot of uh, the web page where you can download this white paper. Um, and this white paper covers, um, it's called the Conservation Financial Framework. And I believe the next slide shows the definition that, that Lee presented, or part of it at least, um, mechanisms and strategies that generate, manage, and deploy financial resources and align incentives to achieve nature conservation. So it's really important to, to include all those different elements um, when you're thinking about uh, financing land or ocean conservation. Um, it's not about just raising more money um, well, I'll get into that in a little bit more. So if the next slide, the next slide uh, shows sort of where we estimate global financing for conservation comes from for biodiversity. This comes from the OECD, a really excellent report that, that recently came out um, that summarizes global biodiversity uh, finance. And as you can see, domestic public finance is predominantly the, the largest source of finance for, for nature conservation, which makes a lot of sense given that, um, that nature is often a, it's a public good. It's something that's usually external to, to corporate uh, books and things like that. So we do need um, not only um, domestic budget finance for, for nature conservation, but also um, the right laws and regulations in place that can align those interests. Um, you know, you can see uh, ODA, which is Official Development Assistance, which is basically, you know, um, uh, government grants and things like that, and international uh, transfers, um, is and, and multilateral ODA, which would include the Global Environment Facility, things like that. It's quite low um, relative to, to domestic expenditure. And then pr private finance, which is growing, and really we hope um, to greatly scale it up over the next uh, decade, for example, is still only um, a, a small, relatively small percentage of, uh, of finance for nature. The next slide um, describes the sort of breadth of conservation finance mechanisms. And these are, when we did this white paper, we, we ended up developing a taxonomy of conservation finance tools. This uh, is the sort of list of the high level um, categories and then there's a next level, which has about 34 categories underneath this. And then of course there's, there's you know, hundreds of different mechanisms and tools, some of which you can um, get some information on at, at conservationfinance.info, which is, uh, has been hosting the legacy conservation finance guide. Now we, it still has that, or a good part of that. And now we've just increased it with uh, this information. So return-based investments, classic private sector, from finance industry point of view, you know, the finance industries, they say they've got a lot of money on the sidelines, sidelines looking for investment opportunities. 
um, and that sort of category covers a lot of them. Economic instruments are those tools like tax credits, for example, that, that allow um, governments to, to better align incentives and to get the private sector uh, to invest. Grants and other transfers or, or, or environmental trust funds or conservation trust funds, um, that's probably what we're most familiar with. A business and markets, we, 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 that category is focused really on operating businesses. And so that speaks to some of what Peter was saying about you know, the interesting activities in the supply chain, um, sustainability and zero deforestation uh, pushes, things like that. Um, public financial management uh, includes the, the full array of, uh, of government uh, public spending act opportunities, and uh, as I mentioned, that's predominantly the, the largest sum of money going to conservation. So it's really important to remember to to work with uh, the local government to to try to direct some of that money towards your conservation outcomes. The next, the last two are, are sort of emerging, really interesting risk risk management. You know, how can we reduce the risks of investment? How can we um, use the risks? the risk abatement that nature provides as a, as a finance tool. And then finally, uh, financial efficiency. There's a range of, of mechanisms that will allow us to achieve greater conservation outcomes with less um, money being spent. So if we could be uh, more efficient, we would, uh, we would improve it. The next slide um, is going to go through a series. You could just kind of click through a few of these. So um, the, uh, when you put it all together, what the strategy here is, is that there's options to both um, increase money for nature, increase the capital for conservation in the top right, but also decreasing the cost of conservation. Um, some of the examples that Peter gave do that. Um, the idea here is that nature costs money because we put pressure on it for the most part. And uh, if we can reduce those pressures, then, um, then we can actually reduce the cost of conservation. It's much easier not to have to raise uh, an additional $10 million for some activity than to have to raise it. Um, and below the, the line, sort of the bottom two are about uh, behavior. So if you click through a few more, um, the, uh, you know, the, the top are about money, the bottom's about behavior. On one hand, you can incentivize positive actions as you can increase uh, money for, for conservation, or you could, um, try to decrease the, the harmful actions and, and decrease the negative impacts of nature. And we consider a lot of these tools, of course, they in, it integrates with, with activities in conservation. Um, uh, but uh, we do like to take a, put a finance and, and, and monetary framework on a lot of these uh, approaches and show ways that you can do it better. So we'll move on to the next. Um, so there's, so I guess what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of information about those tools. Um, they involve all the different sectors, as, as, as Peter uh, and Lee were mentioning. Um, and, uh, but why are we still struggling? Why are, are we not financing nature in the way we, we know it should be? It provides so many services for, for us and, and so many benefits. Um, and so we've come with uh, the four main barriers that um, there's probably more, but, but um, these might help understand a bit some of the challenges and some of the opportunities for, for increasing. Um, and uh, these, uh, these barriers are structural, governance, information, and knowledge. And um, they, of course, inter interrelate. But for the structural is that, that nature is generally a, a public good. It's something that's, that's often shared, um, the benefits of which, uh, like clean water and uh, climate regulation, things like that, um, are shared among large numbers of people. Um, they are external, generally, to government, uh, to, to uh, company um, financial statements and, and accounting. Uh, companies don't necessarily have to pay for the pollution that they, that they create, for example. That's when you bring in some of these solutions like polluter pays and user pays. The second structural problem is governance, and that um, because of the complexity of the structural issues, um, governance is an essential tool to, to improve management. And um, in many parts of the world, um, good governance is difficult. Um, there's, there's times issues, there's politics, there's, uh, there's all kinds of uh, challenges with governance, both at the local level and uh, at the national and, of course, international level. Um, it's very hard to, to do some of these international agreements. Um, the third one is information. Information is, um, uh, this is about getting the right information from one person to the next for the most part, as, as I said, um, and, and here's to the conservation finance 
network and everyone that's trying to promote these ideas and, and share knowledge about conservation finance because um, we have tools that work. Um, user fees, entrance fees to, to protected areas or different sites of interest. They're used all over the world. They work. They're a great way to, to generate revenue and to direct that to conservation. They're just not used efficiently or effectively in, in many places of the world. And many places don't use them at all. Um, some on purpose, like New Zealand, but, um, but for the most part, um, they, uh, they do provide a great source of local revenue for communities and for um, protected areas, for example. Um, and then finally, knowledge is maybe we don't know everything that we need to do, and we need to develop it through innovation, through research, through science, and, um, uh, and this will also help. So I'm going to move on to those and give you some examples. Um, this comes back, back to the initial list I mentioned, return-based investment. Um, for example, microfinance tools. There's an approach with village savings and loans associations that where the, the community itself agrees on uh, implementing a management plan for, for nature um, in exchange for setting up a, like a, a community bank. Um, there's a range of, uh, of, of venture capitalists dabbling in this. Um, here's a private equity firm focusing on oceans, Blue Ocean Partners. And then... Um, for example, uh, Althalia and Morova, they've, uh, they've got a, a range of funds that they're investing in nature. They've got great uh, land-based experiences. Um, carbon tends to be a, an additional value of what they do, um, but a lot of it is uh, sustainable commodities and making investments there. Um, the next slide covers uh, some economic instruments. Um, these are, again, classic ways uh, for governments to, to put in place the right incentives. Green taxes, um, as I mentioned before, are ways to, to implement the polluter pays principle, which not only reduces pollution if it's done right, but it could also um, increase revenue for the government that could be, could be allocated to conservation. Um, I mentioned tourism entrance fees before um, and tradable fisheries quotas. It's very complicated uh, to manage marine areas and, uh, and this is one way to, uh, to do it. The next slide covers um, some examples from, from our uh, friends at Biofin, and these come from the Philippines, and um, it shows how important government funding is, for example, and how important government regulations is, and, and the other, the second one is a private uh, solution, but the first one, um, Biofin has been working with um, uh, Congresswoman uh, Josephine Ramirez Satu for a long time, and she's been a strong proponent of protected areas. It turned out that Philippines had a lot of protected areas on the books. They weren't official, and because they weren't official, um, government didn't have to allocate any budget for it. So in 2018, they passed a new law that increased the number of officially gazetted protected areas from 13 to 107. And now the new budget um, uh, will, will, will include about $46 million uh, for um, financing those protected areas for running, basic operation. So again, government money, very important, getting it right, good governance. And the second is, um, a really interesting uh, platform um, that was uh, set up for, for mobile money, so it's Gcash, and um, they uh, they worked with this uh, with this company and launched a, a tree planting uh, concept, where the users of the of the mobile money platform would buy certain things that would generate eco type credits or whatever that then they would construct a tree on their application, ultimately um, generating enough money to then plant a tree. So it was a good uh, customer connection um, opportunity and it was a, uh, um, a great way to, to you know, generate money for, for tree planting in key watersheds in the Philippines. The next slide. Um, and David, is, I'm uh, just here to give you two minutes. Yeah, I think I'm going to be uh, done quite soon, Lee. So um, thanks. The, uh, the next slide here is uh, uh, financial efficiency. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an opportunity. This is a different way of, of looking at some of these issues. Um, one example is mainstreaming biodiversity and development, um, working for water in South Africa, um, where you, um, you know, use jobs programs to do, get conservation outcomes achieved. And then, of course, there's numerous public-private partnerships where, uh, in this case, uh, pictures of African parks has been around for, for 20 years plus. And uh, they, they come in and they manage protected areas. They manage uh, different sites that are owned by government um, uh, through a, a public-private partnership. And they tend to do it um, efficiently and um, using some private sector money in cases. And... Uh, can um, greatly reduce the cost to the government for managing these areas and manage them in ways that are efficient and effective. 
And the next slide, I believe, is my thank you. So thank you all for listening. And um, please uh, come to the website, cfalliance.org or conservationfinancealliance.org and uh, sign up for our newsletter. Back to you, Lee. Excellent, David. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to the next presentation here. So Marnie, um, you can take it away. Hi. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, so uh, Peter previewed with you a little bit. We've had a journey of our own here in Australia. In a lot of these um, different approaches haven't been activated and so I wanted to share with you a recipe of sorts for how to hold a national conversation on Next slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, so just to interrupt you, Marini, but we're having a little bit of issue with your audio. So you may want to just, oh, okay. you may want to just come a little bit closer to your screen and then we should be all set. Yep. Sure. How's that? And I'll speak nice and loudly. That's great. We hear you now. That's good. Okay. So a little bit about us, uh, Trust for Nature. We are a private land conservation organization in Victoria. Half of the Australian Land Conservation Alliance, which Peter has already mentioned. So that's an alliance of the key private land conservation organisations right across Australia um, that are working. Sorry, Marnie, we, sorry. Still, we still seem to be having issues with your audio. I'm sorry. Uh, I will, I'm off mute. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. Are you, is it still hard to hear me? No, now it seems to be working fine, but just once in a while okay. it, it goes into a little bit of a robot voice. Um, oh, so that's a shame. Maybe it'll work if you just go a little bit more slowly. And I'm just, because we didn't hear you okay. for the slide, Maybe you could just uh, explain this slide one more time. Yeah, sure. Right, so, um, sorry everyone, I know how frustrating it is um, when it's difficult to hear. We were testing it was fine, so I'll turn off the video in a moment if you're still struggling to hear me. Um, but yes, we've led this work on behalf of our national alliance, the Australian Land Conservation Alliance which is all the key organisations in Australia working on private land conservation. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the need, I, I think I can just show these two photos and don't need to say much more, but we all know the drastic need and it's, it's acute here in Australia, as in many places between climate change, drought, bushfires, we know that we need to find more funding for conservation. And historically, Australia has had a pretty traditional funding approach of using philanthropic grants and government grants. And we know that we need to find different opportunities about how we can um, fund conservation here. And Marnie, your audio is going again. So maybe if you uh, want to cut video. Yep, sure. Okay, great. Um, so every recipe needs ingredients. Uh, so here's the four key ingredients we've used for our Okay, the first ingredient is funding for the work. Um, so uh, just noting that it's very hard to do new things without dedicated funding for that. It's really hard to find the time. Um, and the, the capacity, as many people working in not-for-profits would know, to um, do something new without dedicated funding. So our organisation has been lucky enough to be funded by the RE Ross Trust for several years to build our own capacity around conservation finance. And then for this work we've led on behalf of our National Alliance, we were able to um, find 
uh, funding from our federal government and two state governments, and then also had um, a venue provided by one of our large banks, NAB. So now, next slide. The second ingredient was scoping the possibilities. So we did a global audit of um, conservation finance approaches that are out there. And then we looked at them and investigated whether or not uh, they are applicable to Australia, whether they're scalable and also uh, how easy they would be to implement in the Australian context. So anyone's welcome to access that report. It's on our website, Trust for Nature, under the publication section. Obviously, the Australian section is not so relevant to anyone outside Australia, but all of the approaches there um, are all applicable. They're all globally. And at the back, we have an appendix with many case studies that are examples of some of those approaches. And obviously, now that the Conservation Finance Alliance has done its white paper, um, those two can work in tandem. The third ingredient is conservation finance workshops. This is a critical part of our work because we really needed to essentially upskill a whole sector and, and the sector covering private, philanthropic, not-for-profit and um, government. So we've hosted two conservation finance intensives and um, we're planning to have another one this year, but of course it has been um, delayed due to the pandemic. The fourth ingredient is bringing in external expertise. And this has been a critical part for us because as you would have seen on that evolution slide that Peter had earlier, it has been an evolution and, and he and, and others have really had their careers track that evolution. And, and where Australia sits more in, in the middle of that evolution, we've essentially been able to look into the future and bring in the expertise of these people who have lived experience with these different models of funding conservation. So, and the, the feedback from our attendees at the conservation finance intensives was that was a, a really critically important part of running these workshops to bring in that external expertise. We've also been able to rely on um, the conservation finance network who helped us draw up the scoping paper in the first place and provide support to us. So thank you very much to them as well. So now we move to the next part of a, a recipe, which is the method. So uh, like most recipes, you've got to mix it all up. And so uh, for us, that involved bringing all these people to our conservation finance intensives and, and really specifically programming in mixing opportunities. It includes social, included social opportunities, also uh, interactive table work. You can see the bottom right slide. People put up bios about themselves, what they're interested in, what they want to learn. And that was all part of a, a very explicit objective to create an informal network of conservation finance practitioners in Australia. Next slide, please. A bit more on our method. At the workshops, we also had um, what we called the Croc Tank, which was our Australian version based on the TV show, The Shark Tank, where attendees get to pitch their ideas to a panel. The panel had real fake cash to hand out, in the future, it'd be great to have real, real cash to hand out. Um, but it was a really great way to break up the format of um, more traditional workshops with speakers. And also it, it really helped the attendees to, to think more critically about how they pitch their own projects to funders. And uh, a key learning from that was really that conservationists are really good at telling the conservation story, but not so good about talking about the finances. Um, so that's an area for improvement for us. We also, those funny stickers you see on the right, um, ran a poll before and after the first conservation finance intensive to see what people thought were most interested, was most in need of development in the Australian context around conservation finance. And the green are the before stickers and the yellow are after. And, and you can see there was some quite a bit of movement in various topics. I won't go into them. Um, one of the most interesting ones, it's the top right one there, which is uh, intermediaries, the, the role of intermediaries, these people who can bridge the gap between private sector, not-for-profit um, government and really talk the language of everyone is a, a critical, critical enabling factor in being able to advance um, the whole sector around conservation finance and new approaches. Next slide, please. 
So what did we make? Uh, Lots of things, you've seen lots of it, but probably this figure which comes out of our scoping paper best represents our, I think, overall learning, which is that context is everything. And so, you know, it can be quite overwhelming to hear about all these amazing models that are being used all over the world. But it's also about with, you need to understand them better to understand where you fit in. So for an organisation like ours, where our core mission is conserving wilderness areas and threatened species, we're sitting at the far left end of that spectrum. Um, Looking at the top arrow, we generally aren't able to provide a return on our investment and generally we're going to be funded by government grants and philanthropic giving. But if we can move into projects or other people are doing projects, for example, that involve sustainable farming, then you can start to look at there being financial returns and and being able to access other pools of finance. Next slide. Um, So where to next? It's it's very much a journey for us. Um, It's a continued process of of education for all of us and making more connections. Where we're really starting is where we already have work going. It's rather than start from scratch, we've seen it's much easier to build on things that already exist. So four really quick examples. Sustainable agriculture. Agriculture is a big part of the Australian economy. So that's a really good place um, to start. How can we, um, for example, adapt our conservation covenant or conservation easement to be working on productive farms? Uh, Water markets. uh, Peter mentioned the uh, Nature Conservancy has got up its Murray-Darling Basin Water Fund. There's information on that um, online if you wanted to look at that. We have a carbon market. So how can we bring carbon income to bear in conservation and also we have a quite strong regulated biodiversity credit market so how can we expand that and include potentially a voluntary um, biodiversity credit market to fund further conservation and in the meantime we'll just keep on building our network of conservation finance practitioners thank you for bearing with me with the technical problems everyone thank you very much Marnie, you were a total trooper through that. So thank you for rolling with the punches. Um, I think it came across quite clear in the end, both uh, in terms of hearing your voice and conceptually. So thank you. Next slide. So now we're going to shift over to South Africa. And uh, Candice, you can take it right away. All right, thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon from sunny South Africa and to all the participants from around the world. Firstly, I would just like to offer my condolences um, for anybody that suffered loss or hardship during COVID-19. And then thank you to David and Peter and Marnie for setting such an excellent context to conservation finance globally um, and highlighting the progress that's been made in the Australian context. So South Africa, like many other countries across the world, faces severe financial shortages in addressing our landscape conservation challenges and enabling all the benefits that sustainable landscapes bring to the economy and to people. But we have had some interesting innovative finance successes um, and we've seen the emerging of a new landscape finance or conservation finance sector in South Africa, which is very exciting. So if we move to the first slide, a bit of background on the South African context. South Africa is home to diverse people and diverse landscapes. And we face some fundamental challenges as a developing nation, both socially, environmentally, and economically, with high unemployment, a heavy reliance on coal, climate risks such as day zero, which was faced in the city of Cape Town, and 50% of our ecosystems threatened. There are, however, some exciting innovations around landscape conservation and conservation finance, which bring us into a space of opportunity um, to to look at cross-cutting solutions to create sustainable and resilient landscapes and a resilient economy as well. And this is particularly evident um, considering what we're facing in terms of the impact that we felt as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So what we've done in South Africa very recently is to launch the country's first sustainable landscape finance coalition, 
which was launched by Wilderness Foundation Africa and WWF South Africa. And this conservation finance um, coalition is really there to drive catalytic and innovative change and to start to bring new financial resources into our landscape conservation efforts. And I think what we've seen from the other presenters is this real need to create a cohesive network and a strategic approach and to pull together cross-sector collaboration and different experts if we're going to address the finance needs for landscape conservation. And so this is South Africa's first attempt at this and we're very excited about it. Um, and so if you look at the progress that's being made in the US um, and what's happening globally and the progress in Australia, um, South Africa is now moving into the space to create this cohesive sector. The next slide indicates the aims of the Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition in South Africa. And essentially that's to address the urgent need for additional finances um, and launch a national network to create a central focal point around partnerships and engagement on this issue. And ultimately, we want to catalyze new and innovative finance solutions and bring them into the South African context. I think Marnie alluded to this really well in that the individual context per country and per landscape um, means that you have to look at solutions for that particular context and those particular landscapes. We could move on to the next slide, please. So our Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition has three structures. The first is a council, which operates as a national advisory body. And this represents cross sectors in the country and particularly aims to bring in private sector decision makers and investors, um, public sector policy mandates, um, and civil society that represent conservation implementation. Our innovation hub is aimed at being dynamic and flexible as a platform for engagement for stakeholders and implementers. Um, and we're hoping to do similar conservation finance boot camps that have been done in other parts of the world um, and planning the first one in our neighboring country in Eswatini for September of this year, hopefully. But one of the very important things that's happened under the coalition is we've launched finance solution incubators. And these incubators are a coordinated approach to specific finance solution investigations. And it's essentially how we start to develop a particular finance solution concept. The incubators are designed to answer key questions, determine the finance solution building blocks, and look at a roadmap for the critical success factors. And we have a very strategic approach to how we undertake these finance solution investigations and how we build them in a three-phased approach from investigation under the incubator building into feasibility, pilot testing, and eventually mainstreaming and upscaling those impacts. And so you'll see from the next slide that this process and approach was followed with one of South Africa's leading innovative finance solutions. Um, and I'd like to spend a bit of time unpacking this as an example of what can be achieved with an innovative finance solution approach. So South Africa created its first biodiversity tax incentive. And you'll see from the infographic on the screen that over a five year period, we followed the three phase approach to investigate the viability of this as a finance solution, particularly for our protected areas that are non-state owned. We then moved into piloting this across different landscapes in the country and eventually took it to scale. This biodiversity tax incentive is essentially an income tax deduction that's based on the value of land declared as a protected area on privately or communally owned land in South Africa. It's a positive incentive um, and it speaks to David's slide that um, referenced positive behavioral change. And this really rewards the highest level of conservation commitment that South African citizens can make in declaring protected areas on their land and protecting the biodiversity and ecological infrastructure. The incentive has essentially introduced a new stream of financial resources for South Africa's protected areas that was never there before. And it's estimated that by 2026, it will introduce US dollar value 83 million, which is 1.4 billion Rand into the South African protected area network. We've seen a um, considerable institutional support from the South African government for this. 
um, and it fits very well into the regulatory and policy framework of the country, both for protected areas as well as for fiscal policy and tax legislation. Essentially, this tax deduction increases liquidity, which means that there is financial sustainability for the protected area as well as the associated businesses of that protected area which is critically important um, for a developing nation and for growth, which tax efficiency leads towards. So if you move to the next slide, I'd like to indicate what the building blocks were to this innovation. Um, and building blocks are really critical, um, in my opinion, in creating new innovative finance solutions, because they allow you to determine what your critical success factors are, what your hurdles or barriers would be and how to unlock those or move around them and be able to implement strategically and effectively into a landscape. And the first building block for this particular finance innovation in South Africa was strong collaboration across public, private and civil society sectors. And the Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition is now fostering this at a national level to enable other finance solutions to have this type of cross-sectoral collaboration. The second building block was having niche technical skills on board. Um, and this is something that I would really like to emphasize that in some cases, particular finance solutions will require dedicated expertise. And I think Marnie alluded to this in the conservation intensives that have taken place in Australia in bringing external experts. And there may be internal or external experts that come on board, but their technical skills will help to unlock some of the intricacies around a particular finance solution. The third was a cohesive community of practice. And in South Africa, we have a very innovative model for landscape conservation called biodiversity stewardship. And this community of practice was critical in being able to translate the success and innovation of the biodiversity tax incentives across the country. The fourth is around grassroots engagement. And this is again, in my mind, very critical. The grassroots engagement with actual landowners and communities that were safeguarding protected areas in South Africa in, allowed us to in, create a biodiversity tax incentive that spoke directly to the financing needs on the ground. And so we avoided the trap of creating something that didn't actually have a practical benefit or tangible financial result at the end of the day and pairing those two processes together through grassroots engagement was critical to ensuring that there were legitimate financial resources that were released into these landscapes. And the last building block was having a strong legislative and policy framework. So essentially, South Africa's biodiversity tax incentive for our protected areas, the requirements are the protected area requirements. And this addresses one of the key barriers that David alluded to earlier around governance. And so South Africa's model around protected areas, whether they're privately or communally or state owned, have strong governance and management models, which allowed us to alleviate some of the risks that National Treasury was asking when allowing the tax incentive in the first place. The last slide of my presentation speaks to a testimonial to show how the tax incentive is actually benefiting um, landowners and communities on the ground. And it happens in a myriad of different ways. The tax incentive being based on the value of land means that the, the value of the incentive differs greatly from different parts of the country to different sizes and different activities that take place on the protected areas. Um, and the resultant use of the tax incentive is very varied. Um, this is an example where a particular protected area in our wildlife economy node was able to use the increase in cash flow as a result of the tax deduction um, to increase their anti-poaching activities. So on the screen, you'll see one of South Africa's most iconic species. Um, and I'm sure many will be aware of the anti-poaching um, constraints that we have um, and the war on poaching, particularly for rhinos. And in this case, um, the costs are extremely high. So for this protected area to protect the black rhinos on their property, they have to afford the anti-poaching costs. And the, the tax deduction and increased liquidity enabled them to employ more currently unemployed people from local communities in the area in order to safeguard the, the species. And what that does is it creates better viewing for um, ecotourism and for the lodges that are run on this property. 
And so this is an example of where tax efficiency has benefited not only species and the protected area, but at the same time has allowed for additional employment, which is critical in the South African context, as well as increasing the business sustainability required for this protected area. So I hope that that gives you a picture of what's available in the South African context. Thank you, Candice. That was really great and certainly gives an idea of uh, where folks can start to think about some similar types of innovative approaches, partnerships, and collaborations. So at this point, I believe we're going to turn on the panelists' videos for a bit of panel discussion before opening it up to Q&A. I'm going to jump right in with a question for David. Uh, so if we could, across the panel, keep the answers as brief as possible. I think we'll have about eight minutes for this part. So David, uh, how do you adapt an idea from one place to another? We've heard a lot of examples of certain uh, concepts or ideas being adapted to a different context. And we know that there are folks out there exploring certain applications of things that fit in an English common law context to a civil code country context. Um, and that those pathways are being pursued at the moment, but your insight on how you really adapt an idea to another context. Thanks, Lee, <clears throat> and thank you um, for the question. A really great one. It, it's the, you know, it's very hard adapting things from one country to the next, but on the, at the same time, um, the way that uh, nature and finance are related, um, we tend to have the same problems everywhere. Um, and I mentioned some of those structural barriers before. So, um, you know, the, the obviously, and, and you kind of alluded to it, the first um, issue is, you know, do we have the right regulatory environment for that solution? Um, the second is, do we have the capacity to implement that solution? And, you know, capacity can be built, but it does take time. And um, so, um, and, and I guess then the third is, is you know, really digging into it via a feasibility study um, and um, you know making sure the economics of that solution work what is driving it what's incentivizing people um, are the stakeholders that are that are being impacted and influenced you know involved in this solution are they in alignment or do they have do you have to build awareness and um, you know i we encourage people to start with the things that they know and um, see, see if you can grow the existing solutions that you have, the existing finance tools that you're using. See first if you can grow them. Uh, secondly, see if you can um, uh, add new sources of funding to existing types of mechanisms. For example, if you're used to getting grants, get more, get more donors, things like that. And then, you know, of course, to, to get that, the jump in scale and the jump in impact, you do have to go for both a new, new source and a new instrument. But it does, you just have to realize you have to manage expectations, it takes time, and, um, it, and you have to build that capacity. Absolutely, uh, and definitely speaks to where folks can think about how to start. So next question, Candice, uh, if I could point this one your direction. What can we all do about the legal and regulatory context that enables much of this work? So I think um, it's looking at what you've got to start off with to see, um, is there something that you can utilize? So the South African example is really clear here. We had very strong protected area legislation and we had strong tax legislation. And so those were two positives that we could pair together um, that created that enabling framework in order for us to create that innovation. Um, and so my suggestion is to look at not what you don't have, but what you do have. Um, and building on what David has said is that, you know, for example, in the US, the tax incentives have focused um, on wealth taxes. Um, in the South African context, that would not have worked, but focusing on an income tax deduction did work. Um, and so it's to, to look at the building blocks that were available as opposed to trying to take the detail and build it into a very different context. Um, and if there are critical gaps in the regulatory and policy frameworks um, that you require to build a finance solution, the big question is, um, can we fix them? Can we plug them? Or is that process too difficult? And should we be looking elsewhere 
um, and rather start with low hanging fruit? What is the most viable option for us? Absolutely. And uh, across both your remarks, I'm hearing, you know, <laughs> inventory what you have, do some feasibility studies, um, if applicable. And then Marnie, this question for you, kind of along those lines, uh, your insight on folks on the line trying to figure out, you know, what in their operating context or geography may be applicable, may be possible. Uh, where do you think, where would you advise them to start? Yeah, a good way that we noticed was we looked at the people who turned up to our conservation finance intensive and what were they working on? And that was what to, what we had to build on. It was a really good starting point. I looked around the room and we had people in sustainable agriculture. We had people trading biodiversity offsets and carbon offsets, um, working in the water markets. And that's a really great place to start. You don't want to start from scratch. Absolutely. Pivoting over to Peter now, um, how do we get smarter? You talked a bit about the blending of different sorts of capital or finance. And I know we've talked about this back and forth even this week, but how do we get smarter about blending different types of conservation finance? Um, I think we need to listen <laughs> well. Um, you know, blending means that there are uh, essentially many parents in the family, so to speak. Um, and what's going to motivate them to take a risk, to provide capital, to provide concessionary financing, to provide guarantees, whatever the mechanism might be. And, uh, you know, an example might be the work in, in, uh, in the states that uses new markets tax credit financing, um, albeit a, a slightly cumbersome mechanism for concessionary debt but it's aligning uh, a public policy interest in economic uh, growth and economic vitality in distressed communities with natural resource conservation. And quite candidly, it took a while for the world of community development finance organizations in the US to get comfortable applying that mechanism uh, to land conservation. Uh, and I think it got took a while for the land conservation NGOs and the private investment partners that they have to get comfortable working with community development finance institutions. So I think part of it is just learning what is going to be of interest and what is going to be uh, the nature of the impact and outcomes that various partners uh, want to produce. Excellent. Uh, good insight and advice. Thank you for just indulging a bit of panel discussion. We're now going to open up to some of the questions that have come through the Q&A function. So let's jump right in. Uh, anyone on the panel have experienced funding less traditional conservation strategies like, the funding, like funding the creation and running of indigenous guardian or ranger programs? Resources, thoughts? Uh, we don't have personal experience, but um, I work with people who work in Indigenous organisations. Traditionally, they have been funded here, um, ranger, ranger programs inclusive, through government funding has been the key source. Also some philanthropic funding, also some grant funding from, uh, for example, example, large mining companies working on those Indigenous lands. There is also a, a really nice case study from Namibia, um, which is also one of South Africa's neighboring countries um, that looks at wildlife conservation services um, and how that translates um, to, to people from communities. So it's something to, to look up. Absolutely. Um, pivoting to a question from Armenia, looking for resources or first steps. Um, oh, the question just shifted here. Uh, sorry, from Armenia, um, particularly for thinking about work with endangered species, in this case, the uh, Caucasian leopard, interested in resources on biodiversity offsets and anyone on the panel who has resources or first steps. Well, I'm happy to take this one if, if no one jumps in. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the, there's a great uh, set of resources on biodiversity offsets that's uh, uh, located if you look up the Business and Biodiversity Offset Program at Forest Trends. I believe they have a legacy site there. They worked for, I think, almost 15 years on biodiversity offsets. Uh, globally, they have guidance and all kinds of um, uh, how-to reports and, and things like that. Um, you know, offsets are... are uh, really great opportunity to, to capture some revenue from the private sector um, that where they have a planned impact on nature. Um, it's really important when you're setting something like that up, if, if the country doesn't have it, to integrate it fully into the uh, mitigation hierarchy or the environmental impact um, assessment uh, legislation for, for projects. And um, and often, you know, there's, you know, approaches that, that some alternative approaches could involve just paying for those offsets and having someone else do them. That's called in lieu financing or in lieu payments. And these tend to be a lot less regulated and um, don't have the same direct impact as, as more um, uh, banking type approaches uh, like you see in America and uh, Australia. So, um, so there's a bunch of great uh, approaches. Um, I think there's close to 60 countries that have some sort of legislation about this kind of compensation in their laws, but, um, but many of them are not being uh, implemented effectively enough to, to result in uh, um, clear, clear outcomes. But it's, it's, everyone's exp experimenting. It's a great thing to do, I believe. And a follow-up, just asking for um, a clarification on the name of the group, David. Um, Bebop. Business, BBOP, Business Biodiversity Offset Program. Um, and the Forest Trends is the, or, the larger organization that, that uh, has housed, housed, hosted them for a long time. Perfect, thank you. Uh, now, how about insurance companies? Uh, how are insurance companies getting into conservation finance in recognition of the impact or threat of natural disasters? Um, I'll take this one again. The, um, th this is, a, in my opinion, this is really early stage for what soon will be a really exploding opportunity here because a lot, a lot of the value that nature provides is reducing risk. And if we can capture that somehow uh, through the, if the insurance industry can capture that better, I think that um, there's a lot of money to be made and a lot of impact to be seen. Um, the kind of most common example is a, a TNC project um, that involved a range of partners, uh, Mar Fund and others, um, in the Quintana Roo uh, on the Yucatan Peninsula. And um, the, uh, the idea is to sort of engage hotel owners and engage the, the reinsurance industry because insurance is too, the, apparently there's, there's so many individual insurance uh, companies locally that you, you, you don't have, a, even if you have a systematic storm impact it affects all these different companies to a smaller degree because they're they have only a couple policies whereas the reinsurers they group policies so they're much more interested in these systematic impacts that that uh, that storms and 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 uh, green infrastructure can can abate um and uh so so there's a uh, the ability to uh to use parametric insurance which is where um, a storm comes if the wind speeds reach a certain uh velocity, the insurance uh, policy kicks in and the reef can be restored right away. So you don't have to wait to measure the economic impacts or things like that. And then there's other policies that they're, they're trying to put in place to, uh, you know, see if, if, there, if there may be a reduction in, um, in the premiums of the hotels if they invest in coral reef, things like that. So it's, it's super early stage, but great, great potential. Absolutely. Um... And then let's see, I'm gonna try and lump together two questions in a Chilean context, as I think they're somewhat related or at least could be answered in relation. So um, in a country that doesn't necessarily have little, that has little recognition of uh, certain types of ecosystem services, et cetera, uh, if you have an agricultural company looking to quote unquote monetize the conservation values on a given property, uh, how might you think about approaching such a project? And then to lump in with that question, um, given that there are not tax incentives in Chile, um, 
are there other tax or policy measures that could help to set the stage for lawmakers getting closer or more comfortable uh, to approving a tax incentive? I'm, I'm happy to talk to the tax section um, if Peter wants to talk to the, the agricultural side. Why don't we do the tax section first? Sure. Um, so tax incentives um, can really be divided into two components um, and it links to behavioral change. So you could have positive tax incentives that reward good behavior, like declaring a protected area on your property as an example, um, or that essentially punish bad behavior like a sin tax. Um, carbon tax is a prime example of that. Um, and the OECD has extremely good guidance on this and a lot of evidence around the fact that positive incentives change behavior and a lot more effective um, in the long run, um, but obviously don't bring um, fiscal revenue in. They're, they're actually limiting um, the amount that comes into the fiscus. So there's, there's a fine line to, to walk there. Um, but in terms of tax incentives for, for Chile, um, that would be, you know, is this something that is going to, to unlock a number of other benefits in the country? Is it going to, to impact your private land conservation and change behavior? So it might be something that you see that's happened in other countries like South Africa or that's happening in Catalonia um, and think this, this would be ideal for our country. But I think it would really come down to um, unpacking the, the context to see what are the hurdles there? Um, is it actually going to be feasible and viable? Um, and what are the benefits that will roll out as a result? And I think that's essentially where you need to start. Um, and, and if it's something that can be unpacked in, in an incubator um, type of platform like we have in South Africa or intensives like we have in Australia, that would be the, the best step to really see, have we answered all the key questions around tax incentives for Chile or not? Um, and do we have the necessary building blocks to put those in place? Um, and I think the South African building blocks are an example of what we needed to have in order to introduce this into the South African context. Um, we had the institutional support from government, grassroots engagement, and the community of practice that was required and the legislative and, and policy framework. So to be able to tick those from the onset um, made it a lot easier to actually introduce this. Um, and that, that's really my advice on where to start. I think that's great. And, and there is, um, you know, progress being made, albeit maybe not as uh, quickly as everyone would like in creating those tax incentives in Chile. Um, but for the purpose of, of the questioner, I think there's two areas to go in. One is, uh, are the, is there any kind of um, corporate social responsibility marketing benefits, uh, meaning that the produce uh, that is grown on this ag land that is being sustainably managed, can that be translated and shared with the end user, the buyer, uh, through a, a, a marketing program? And, and certainly there are examples of that happening in other parts of the world as we speak. Uh, the second, uh, as we wait for the you know, fullness of public policy to kick in as far as tax incentives or different public policies that would provide public grants uh, to pay for you know, the equivalent of a uh, conservation e easement in civil code that would compensate the owner for doing these practices, uh, there is the possibility of aligning impact payments with this sustainable management. So as David mentioned, um, you know, is there a way to really almost connect the specific property owned by this company with uh, some type of environmental impact payment uh, that is uh, happening in another part of Chile or maybe in the same watershed uh, where uh, the dollars are, are actually available? Thanks, Peter. And uh, given that we are at time, sorry for the questions that we didn't have time to get to today, but I wanted to just take uh, moderator privilege and ask for a final parting word from each of the panelists with uh, hope or inspiration, perhaps, as the international community of practice that's joined us today really starts to think about 
taking some of these discussion topics, ideas, suggestions, tools, mechanisms, and thinking about where to get started or where to go next. So a final parting word of uh, perhaps hope or inspiration. I guess I'm happy to start um, real quickly. You know, um, nature is essential to us. We need it for pretty much our existence. And, you know, the, the challenge of, of trying to make sure enough of it is in place is, is, is in our, in a way, our generation and this current generation's job because we're losing it so uh, sp spectacularly. So, um, you know, remember that it's valuable. Remember, people want to connect, they want to conserve it. And so what are the things that are just stopping that natural tendency to actually, you know, create a livable and, and, and long, long life planet here, you know, so let's remove those barriers. Um, well, uh, Lee led us off by uh, apologizing for us all not being together in Barcelona, which would have been lovely um, in April, uh, but next April. Uh, um, but I also want to I think we all have experienced and learned and heard of the appreciation for nature in this time of pandemic. Uh, and uh, I want to be, you know, serious uh, that there is a credible connection to access to the outdoors, uh, the public health benefits of nature, um, management of wildlife resources uh, that all connect uh, either in a very direct or sometimes just indirect way to uh, public health. And uh, I just think we, we all should be motivated by those connections. From me, I'll focus on the people. Something that's just amazed me and continues to amaze me is the generosity of these experts right around the world who are always willing uh, to just pick up a phone and talk something over with you. And, and I'm sure once travel restrictions are lifted, Peter would love to do a conservation finance intensive in many other countries in the world. Um, but seriously, it's, it's just brilliant that, that we're able to build these international connections and we don't have to do it alone. Many people have gone before us and we can um, stand on their shoulders and advance conservation in our own countries. And my encouragement is really around when you look at the often daunting task of bringing in finance for landscape conservation, to be pioneering and problem solving. Um, and the African proverb is, how do you eat an elephant? And that's one piece at a time. Well, I hope everyone can please join me in thanking the panelists. Also a sincere thank you to uh, the International Land Conservation Network, the European Land Conservation Network and the Lincoln Institute uh, with a very special thank you to Chandani and Robin for helping us get organized, helping us stay on track, um, helping us deal with technological issues. Uh, so thanks to everyone for joining us today. And we hope that this is more the start of many conversations going forward and uh, you know, a springboard for plenty of great action to come. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And as people start to sign off, I just want to thank Lee again for guiding us through this session. And thank you for every, to everyone for your questions and patience with us through the technical glitches. And of course, we're so appreciative to Peter, David, Marnie, who's up late for us, and Candace for sharing your insights with us here today. Just a reminder that if you have colleagues who may be interested in this topic or if you would like to revisit any of the presentations, a recording of the webinar today will be available uh, online tomorrow on the website of the ILCN uh, at landconservationnetwork.org. And before we adjourn, I'd just like to invite you all to join us, to join us next Tuesday for the following session of our webinar series. The title of that webinar is Reclaiming Our Freshwater Resources. Uh, the session will provide an overview of how land conservation is being used around the world to advance water security. So I hope to see you there. And with that, I will formally adjourn us. Thank you again and take care.